and uh, we appreciate that. Appreciate always. Appreciate good preaching, and um, we will try just to share a few thoughts with you from the Word of God, and then we'll go home in a little while. I've been here since 1998. We moved to the Milton area in 1998 to start a seaman's mission in Pensacola. Things um, transpired. We weren't able to get it open because of uh, government issues that uh, interfered that we couldn't open the seaman's mission at that time. So the Lord enabled us and led us to start a church. We started a Spanish church that's uh, still going in pace. And, uh, but, but we labored in the city of New Orleans for for some 20 years, reaching merchant seamen from around the world. And during that time, uh, part of the time was in downtown New Orleans in the Ninth Ward, the Lower Ninth Ward. The, when the, uh, during Katrina, when the levee broke, that was in the Upper Ninth Ward, but we were in that area that flooded. And so, but we had already left there. But um, uh, again, we came here and, and, and while we were there, we moved, to, we moved from downtown New Orleans to uh, Bell Chase. That was where we ended our ministry there in, in the New Orleans area. And um, while we were there, my wife ran a thrift store, a small thrift store in Bell Chase. And I ran the boxes and she ran the store. And, and we figured it up after we finished about several years of labor there. We figured we probably made, if we were lucky, we made about 50 cents an hour between us. So it wasn't for the money, let's just say that. But it was a, a good ministry to those merchant seamen, and we used that store to help them with clothes and things of that nature, things that they needed. And, and, uh, but while, while we were running that store, there was a man that came through there, and his name was uh, Mr. Wall. He was an older gentleman, and, and he, uh, he would bring things to the thrift store. He, he was in his, at that time, he was probably in his late 70s, and he drove an old car that he had to get off on the right, he had to get out of it in the right side. Somebody had banged in the driver's side door, so he had to go across the seat and get out on the other side, and it was a, it was a wreck of a car, and I, I was, didn't know how he made it to the store, much less anywhere else, but uh, uh, he, uh, this gentleman was, he was, he, he would get literally angry at the waste that people did. He went around, what he, if you walked across a penny and didn't pick it up, he would be angry. I mean, he'd just get mad. That, that was his nature. And, um, but he would, what he would do would, he would go to the, he'd go around and people would throw this stuff away. They put it out for the garbage man and he'd go get it. And he'd put it in his car and he'd take it home and he'd clean it up and then he'd bring it to the store and donate it to the store and my wife would wait till he'd leave and put it back in the garbage. But uh, <laughs> so, but he did this all the time. I mean, he just was, it was almost like his, his living, you know. And of course, we finally, we, we befriended him and finally got him to come to church some. And, and, um, and then I went to his house a few times. He lived in Algiers. He lived in a big two-story house, a pretty good-sized two-story house in Algiers. And... Um, uh, it was most uh, you've seen the show The Hoarders. Anybody ever seen that on TV? He was what we, what you would call an organized hoarder. When I went in his house, I had to turn, and I was I wasn't near as heavy as I am now then, and I had to turn sideways to get down the hallway because there were boxes stacked to the ceiling in the hallway, full of stuff that he had gotten that he had uh, evidently cleaned up and put in these boxes. And what he was going to do with them is beyond me. Just let them grow to the ceiling. And I guess the reason he brought stuff to us because he didn't have any more room in his house. And so I don't even know where he slept. I'm telling you, there were boxes everywhere. If the place would have caught on fire, it would have gone up like a tinderbox. You know, I mean, it was just that bad. But he, he came to church a little while. He, he, we got him to come into church, and he became fairly faithful. He didn't come all the time. Never became a member. But he, and, he, and, and one day he... He quit coming. And so, and the next time he still came, brought stuff to the store, but the next time he brought stuff, and by the way, during that time, I, I, I bought him a car. Uh, we had a, I used to go to these, um, these uh, storage place auctions, you know, the ones that you see on TV. Well, back then you could get them cheap. Now you can't get them cheap. But anyway, back then you could buy them cheap. And so I was bidding one time and they, they opened this one and there was a, there was a uh, Ford Falcon 
that had been in this storage bin for 20 years. It was in immaculate condition. It was a powder blue. It was in good shape. Still ran. You'd crank right up. and I mean, it was just a nice little car. Probably, if I'd have kept it, it had been worth a considerable amount of money today. But uh, I, I got it, and, and I bought it. I think I paid something like $400 for it. But I, I bought this car, and, and I gave it to this guy because I felt sorry for him. He was so good to us. And, you know, anyway, on and on. But he... Uh, the day after I gave him the car, he came back, to, or a couple of days after, he came back to the store in this brand new, nice little car that I gave him. And he had taken a can of black paint. And he had just sprayed black paint all over this nice little powder blue car. I couldn't believe it. I could have killed him. <laughs> in Christ, of course, but... <laughs> But it was, it was awful. And, uh, but that's the way he was. And so uh, he didn't like the paint, so he fixed it, I guess. I don't know. But uh, I asked him, when he quit coming to church, I went and found him and I asked him. And I said, Why, what's going on? Why aren't you coming back to church? He said, all you ever preach on is hell and salvation. I said, well... I didn't think that I, that was all I preached on. I did preach a few times on other things. And, uh, but that's all he ever heard was hell and salvation because that's probably what he needed the most was salvation and he was afraid of going to hell. So I told him, I asked him this. I said, Mr. Wall, I know where you live. You have a, your house, a nice sized house. And I said, it's full of boxes of stuff. I said, what if I drove by your house one day and saw your house on fire. Saw smoke coming out of one of the windows of your home. And I, and I had a suspicion that you were in there. I, I said, uh, and, and I passed on by and I said, well, God bless you, Mr. Wall. You, I hope you make it. I said, that, I wouldn't be a very good person, would I? He said, well, no. And I said, well, Mr. Wall, I'm telling you today, your house is on fire. House is on fire. Not your little physical house, but your house is on fire because... Hell is your destiny if you don't trust Christ. Well, he didn't come back. I never was able to reach him. He just, was, uh, he just quit on me, and I just couldn't, like, like Brother Rowan says around here all the time, tells people, don't quit too soon. Most people quit too soon and never get to the place to where they rest in Christ. And so I, I want to preach to you just a little while tonight, and I have just a few minutes. I'm going to give Brother Bernie plenty of time to draw and... But uh, your house is on fire if, and I want you to get these points if you would. Your house is on fire tonight if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They had plenty of religion. They would have, if we had them here today in our fundamental Baptist circles especially, they would fit in quite well. I mean, they were the separatists of their day. And they, they weren't liberals. They were fundamental. They believed the fundamentals of the Bible. And most of them could quote much of the Bible. Some of them could quote all of the Pentateuch. And so uh, they were, it wasn't a lack of religion. It wasn't a lack of Bible information. And that's true among our Baptist churches now. It's not a lack of Bible knowledge in the sense of having information from the Bible. Now, it doesn't mean all of it's correct the way it's get, get taken, but uh, uh, they had those things. But Jesus said, and go with me please to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, let me read a few verses for you. In verse 17 it says, Matthew 5, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the pro nor the prophets, but uh, I'm come to des destroy. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot nor tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, to, uh, to, so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter in the kingdom of heaven. 
Now, if we wanted to put it on a scale, a measurement, we could go to the Apostle Paul and take a look. He was one of that group. He was a Pharisee. Said that of himself that he was a Pharisee. In fact, he, in Philippians, and let's do go there, in Philippians chapter 3, if you would. Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul had a pretty good uh, background. Had a pretty good religious heritage, if you will. In chapter 3, let's start reading with verse 4. He said, uh, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He wasn't just a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He said, as touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church. You know, we look at that. I don't know how you look at that, but when I see him sitting, he's persecuting the church. He was boasting of persecuting the church. Do you know that in his mind, to persecute the church was, he was doing it for God. What he was doing, he was doing for God. I mean, he wasn't out here just some hoodlum but going after the church. He was doing, a, he thought what he thought was God of service by going after Christians. And uh, he says persecuting the church is an example of his righteousness. And uh, as touching the law of Pharisee concerning his persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's pretty good. I mean, he had a pretty good life. He, he had a pretty good, some stuff to go with, to, to go on, you know. I couldn't have matched that. You know, if you want to build, if you want to call them these building blocks of a house, he, he lived in the mansion on the, you know, in the, in the high part of town. I lived in a shack in the low part of town. If that's the way you want to measure that righteousness. He had a lot of it. Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, the, the scribes and Pharisees, you'll know why it's entering the kingdom of heaven. See, and, and so it, we could, if we could find anybody better and stack up their righteousness, it still wouldn't be enough. Because our righteousnesses, no matter whose they are, are as filthy rags. We're all as an unclean thing. And if we could ever just get to the place of seeing that. Isaiah, if you want to, and we'd not take the time tonight, but in Isaiah chapter 1, he, he enumerates the works that they were doing. They were offering sacrifices, blood sacrifices. They were going to the temple. They were obeying the feast days. They were going through all of the things that was required in the nation of Israel. By the way, who required that of them? God did. They were doing what God said to do. Yet God said, it's filthy ranks. Yet God said, why do you bring this stuff to me? Who told you to do that? Why are you going through this, these activities? See, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And again, no matter how much you stack it up, it's not enough. You'll in no wise enter in the kingdom of heaven. Or in other words, your house is on fire. You've got to go beyond what man can produce in his natural state. Except your, your house is on fire if you need signs and wonders to believe. This is such a major issue in the church today. And it's, it's, it's really across the board now. I've seen it in, in a lot of places that I've gone and I've preached in, in places where I was in a church one time in Tennessee, in East Tennessee. It was one of my supporting churches back when I was first in a mission work. And on Sunday night, they, I, I, after I preached, the, there was a lady, a girl came forward. She's a young woman, a young mother, I guess. She came forward and, and uh, the pastor was there dealing with her and then there were some people gathering around and they all began to pray and call out to God and begging God to save her. And she was beating the floor. She was kneeling down, beating the floor, praying, pleading with God to save her. And I watched this commotion going on and I, I really was disturbed by it, honestly. I, uh, 
I asked the pastor, when they finally quit, uh, the, you know, all, all praying together, they finally quit, and I asked the pastor if I could talk to the lady. I, I believe pastoral authority. I was a guest speaker in, the, in, the, in there, in the, in, the, in the church, and so he gave me the, the go-ahead to talk to her, and I knelt down beside her, and I began to share the gospel with her. You know what I told her? I said, ma'am, you don't have to beg God to save you. He, he, he wants you saved more than you want to be saved. You don't have to twist God's arm to save you. He's already done everything necessary for you to be saved. You already have a Savior if you'll just believe it. Now, do you see what I'm saying here? Here over here, she's trying to produce something that's going to make her feel better about herself. It's going to make her feel all right. My precious wife... Um, and this is her testimony. I, she's a little shy on the shy side. I keep trying to get her to give her testimony, but I'm going to give it for her. Uh, and, and she was at, at, under, at Brother Doug's church in Okeechobee, and there was a preacher there preaching, and uh, she got under conviction and went forward, and, and uh, they went for, the ladies went forward. A lady, I guess it was the pastor's wife or evangelist's wife, somebody was dealing with her at the altar and got her to pray the sinner's prayer. And she prayed. And, and uh, you'd have to know my wife, she's kind of stubborn. You, you're not going to convince her anything she don't want to be convinced of. I can assure you of that. And those who know her know that. Uh, but this pastor, this uh, missionary wife or evangelist's wife asked her, said, well, you, are you saved? She said, well, I don't know. So they went over it again, and she prayed again. I said, well, are you saved? She said, well, I don't know. And this went on. This, I mean, it went on and on and on. And finally, after about an hour or so, literally, I'm pretty sure that was right, about an hour or so, she, uh, she felt a burden lifted off of her. And so she, having this burden lifted off of her, she said, uh, uh, she, they, they told her she was saved. She was all right. You know, there's only one problem with that. She, had, she, she, had, she thought she was all right right then because that's what they told her. She was all right. But she really never had complete peace. She never had full assurance. And so, and she was married before. She was, her husband passed away, and she, but that was during that previous marriage. And uh, she went through sitting through life, going through and active in church. When Doug got there, she was probably one of the most faithful members of the church, doing everything that needed to be done, just like she does now. And uh, big evangelist came to town. And she just couldn't get settled on that matter, whether or not she was going to heaven. She had peace some of the time, but not all the time. And so she would, uh, she got her husband to bring her to that evangelist. And they went and talked to the evangelist. And he said, well, give me your testimony, sister. And so she told him what happened there at that altar that day, and that weight lifted off of her. You know what he said? Oh, you're all right, sister, go on. Now this is, if I told you the name of the individual, you'd all probably, just about everybody would know him. And uh, now I want to ask you a question. Where did he get such authority to say that she was all right based on that testimony? See? Um, you know, if you're looking for a sign, if you are waiting for something to happen to let you know you're all right, I pray that it doesn't take place. Now, you may think you need something to give you that full assurance, to give you that complete assurance, but it's not a sign that you need. It's a simple acceptance of the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And as we said this morning in our study, in the discussion this morning, when the Word of God, when you believe the truth of the gospel and the Holy Spirit seals you, the results of that will be confidence. Yes. How long confidence? Always confident. Always confident, knowing that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I didn't write that. That's what the Scripture says. Now, and so, but we've got, a, we've got a society today that's looking for something of that nature. Signs and wonders. You know what Jesus said about such a society? 
A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. It's not a sign that we need. It's, again, exposure to the Word of God until we believe it. A lot more could be said about that, but I must hasten on. Your house is on fire if tradition means more to you than the truth of God. Now, this is a hard one. It really is, because most of us don't think we have tradition. We want to say, we're convinced that the Catholics have tradition. We're convinced that the Episcopalians have tradition. We're convinced that everybody else is full of tradition. But we just don't believe that we fundamental Baptists have tradition. But I can tell you we do. And we've got to get to the place to where, you know, there's a, there is a way, there's a proper way to question the Scriptures. There is a proper way, not the Scriptures themselves, but how they're being presented. We talked about Revelation 3.20 this morning. How many people believe that, that Revelation 3.20 is talking about Jesus knocking on the door of somebody's heart trying to get in? I mean, tons of people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Churches, uh, pictures are, are, are produced to, trying to depict that. It's not true. It's not true at all. Romans 10, 13. Most of what's said about Romans 10, 13 is not true. And so it's a misapplication of Scripture. And so there is a proper way to question what's being said or how a passage of Scripture is being used. Go to Mark 7, please. Mark chapter 7. Just a couple of verses here. I really have a lot of verses that I want to use, but lacking of time. So Mark chapter 7. Look at what this says. Uh, it says, uh, it says, then came together, in verse 1, then came together the Pharisees and certain scribes which came from Jerusalem. When they saw some of his disciples eat bread with, uh, with the defile, that is to say, with unwashed hands, he found fault. And the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they washed their hands, oft eat not, holding to the tradition of the elders. Now I'm going to skip down for time's sake. Verse 7, Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as of the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Skip down to verse 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered and many such like things you do. Now, you know where those Pharisees got their traditions from? They got, initially, they got the traditions from the Bible. What the tradition was, was a commentary on the Bible, the Old Testament Scripture. And so, it hadn't changed today, folks. It's exactly the same thing today. The traditions that we hold to are that which we receive, teaching of from the Bible or about the Bible, but misapplication many times of the Bible. Now there's some tradition that's good and it's right to hold to because it's based on the truth of Scripture. But the, what we ought to do is search the Scriptures to make sure what's being... We ought to be like those Bereans who search the Scriptures daily to be certain that what was being taught them was so. Is that not true? Certainly it is. Your house is on fire if you're, if you're waiting for a more convenient season. You know, Felix, he told Paul, when I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. And it went on to say that I'll call for you. He wanted to call for him because he hoped somebody, we'd give him money. But a convenient season. If you're waiting for a convenient season, a convenient season would, could be just where you have more time to study. Do you know that's never going to get to you? It's never going to come? If you're waiting for more time to study the Bible, if you're waiting for a better opportunity, if you're waiting for more convenient circumstances, it's not going to happen. You know what you have to do? 
You had, I, I like what uh, our brother said about this matter of getting so, uh, getting so interested in, or so concerned about hell. Somebody said that. Could being so concerned about going to hell that, uh, that you, Brother Radford said that, that you, that you will, uh, you'll get interested enough to get in the scriptures and find out whatever it is you need to find out. See, if you, let me, let me tell you, there's some people here listening to me tonight that, that you don't know if you're going to heaven or not. You still don't know. You've been in church for a long time and you still don't know. I'm going to say to you tonight that you need to be, you need to treat it as though you were going to die and go to hell tomorrow. That you, today was your last day. And if you wake up tomorrow and it's not your last day, then you better treat it like that's your last day. You better seek the Lord in, with all of your might until you get to the place of resting in what He did for you. See, the real labor involved in salvation is finding out what He did. That's where, he, if there's any work involved, the work is not in, rela in salvation itself. The work is involved in discovery process, if you will. May I say it another way? Like they say it in uh, real estate and in business, due diligence. You have a responsibility of due diligence. We, what we're accustomed to is convenient to religion. Miss Madonna said this morning she was a Catholic most of her life. It's a religion of convenience. Baptist is, the Baptist religion is becoming rapidly a religion of convenience. We've got our little processes, hoops that we jump through and religious uh, ordeals that we go through in order to be, quote, quote, right. It's Christ is salvation. When Simeon held that baby in his arms... He said, now, you, now let thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation in Jesus Christ. And the final thing is, your house is on fire if you're almost persuaded. Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. To be almost persuaded is to be altogether lost. There is no other way. I'm going to close with this, this little story. Some of you, those of you who've been here a long time, may remember. I came through here one time on a trip. I'd gone north and came back, coming back around on my way back to New Orleans. This was back a long time ago when I was still single. And I've uh, been married for 26 years, so that'll tell you how long it's been. But uh, I had a young man with me, a young Chinese fellow. He was from Taiwan. At that time, I was taking classes at the University of New Orleans and and uh, I used it for evangelism. I used every class for an evangelistic platform. I spoke at the Free Speech Alley every week and, and uh, just used it for a manner of evangelism. And so this young man, he had been, gotten exposed to some of my teaching and preaching and, and uh, he had some time off and so I took him with me on a, on a deputation trip. We went to, again to several churches and I'd, went, of course, been witnessing to him for a while. I'd been witnessing to him in school and then I witnessed to him all the way on that trip and and he was under the preaching wherever we went. And, 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 uh, and so we, we stopped at a businessman who was a, also a pastor in one of my supporting churches. And he had a business in this town. And we stopped by his place on the way back. And uh, he, uh, he took this young man. His name was Jimmy. He took Jimmy in, in his office and he read him down the Romans Road. And he, he got Jimmy to kneel and pray with him there in his office. And, rejoicing that he had gotten saved. And I could tell Jimmy was a little disturbed. I, you know, he, he did what the man told him to do. And, but there was no, you could look at him and tell there was no peace. He was still just kind of disturbed. And we got in a van, headed back, headed this way. And, and uh, he, uh, he was just quiet, kind of meditative. You know, he didn't say much. And just out of the blue, and I, wasn't, and I didn't pressure him, just out of the blue, he said, I feel like I'm on the porch looking in the window at those inside the house. And, uh, and he was saying that in relation to himself and his relationship to the, to the Lord. And so that thing of leading him to Christ basically just got in the way of him understanding the truth. See, I had to start over again, basically, and give him, I, and I, of course, I instructed him in some areas that, ask him if he, was, if he knew he was going to heaven. Well, of course, he said no. And um, anyway, I don't know that Jimmy ever got saved. 
I, 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 I tried and I witnessed to him the rest of the time that we were together and the rest of the time in school, but don't know that he ever trusted Christ. I say to you, to be almost persuaded is to be altogether lost. Could be the worst thing to happen to you. Don't stop at the gate. You know, don't stop part way. You must stay with it till you get in. Make sure that you have the peace of God concerning your eternal destiny. That you know for sure and that you know all the time where your spirit's going to go when your body drops to the dirt. All right. Pastor, you want just Brother Bernie to come? Or you? All right, Brother Bernie, you come on.